Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. This uh, essay is called, I Am Resigned. In recent years, I've grown a bit lonely. The main reason is that I enjoy discussing ideas. Yet, dare I raise a counterpoint to our increasingly leftist zeitgeist, I'm often tarred or shunned by my supposedly inclusive friends and colleagues. Here are examples. Devaluing of hard work. The most contributory people tend to work long hours. Yet today's society more venerates work-life balance, de-stressing, and even just be. If Jonas Salk didn't work long work weeks for years, we might still be ravaged by polio. If countless computer geeks didn't work long and hard, we might not have enjoyed decades of Google search, iPhones, and now ChatGPT. If not for hard-working carpenters, clerks, and accountants, America would not run. De-emphasizing intelligence. Leading companies, such as Google, proudly state that they use intelligence as a core criterion in selecting employees. Indeed, reasoning and learning ability are core to college, career, and life success. Yet, today's redistributist society is reluctant even to use the word intelligence. Intelligence tests and their proxies, the SAT, GRE, LSAT, MCAT, and so on, are a uniform yardstick that for a single data point are remarkably predictive of success. Importantly, that's true for all races. Indeed, the test over predicts performance of blacks. Intelligence tests are an antidote to racism. By the way, this, uh, when I make an assertion that uh, would require a citation, in the text version of this, which will be on medium.com, I have the link to uh, the uh, studies or, that rep or whatever that report the, the data. Yet redistributionists, redistribution, redistributionists don't like that blacks score lower, even though those scores overpredict blacks' college and job performance. So activists have foisted reverse racist practices onto employers and colleagues and colleges. The very day that the Supreme Court of the United States banned affirmative action, universities bragged about how they'll skirt even that highest court in the land. For example, colleges will use zip code, underrepresented high schools, and so on, to get the percentage of blacks they want, no matter the effect on whites and Asians who have a better chance of success and societal contribution. That's what universities and many employers did to keep Jews out. Colleges including the likes of Harvard and Yale in the 20th century, hid that goal by claiming that to further ideological diversity, they'll pursue geographic diversity. For example, people from Wyoming and South Dakota, which have few Jews. In fact, two Jewish next door neighbors in New York City are likely to be ideologically different. I know many Jewish people from Queens where I grew up, and our views span the matrix including my best friend and I. Isn't it racist for colleges and employers to select middle-class African Americans with a weaker record over poor whites with a better record? Socialism. Of course, capitalism has both pros and cons. It stimulates achievement, but leaves too many behind. Socialism provides more equality, but reduces incentive to work and tends to reduce achievement and productivity. Besides, Socialism becomes unaffordable. A current example is that British, Britain's national health care system is in tatters, and I do have a link to a CNN and other articles on that. As Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher famously said, eventually you run out of other people's money. People who contribute more to society should be rewarded, not punished. The opposite, which is the redistribution, redistributionist creed, is a formula for increased pain among people and eventually societal dissolution. We seem not to have learned from many countries' failed experiments with socialism and its cousin, communism. More ineffable, but as central a reason for meritocracy, to wrest the, from the contributory to the less so is a cosmic injustice. Climate change. The expert consensus is a two-degree increase in temperature by the end of the century. That will yield the benefit of increased arability in northern climes, and technological solutions such as fusion, hydrogen, and or nuclear 
will decrease greenhouse gas emissions and in turn lower global temperature. In light of those, it seems premature to justify massive taxpayer spending on, for example, forcing people into expensive electrical vehicles, electric vehicles, or mass transit. Money is not unlimited. The Copenhagen Consensus argues, and I have a link to this, that much climate change money and effort would be more wisely spent on other challenges to humankind, such as disease, preventing war, and access to water. Crucially, all that spending assumes that the world's 195 countries, including developing nations that use fossil fuels to keep their people from destitution, will, for at least decades, comply with the restrictions and costs required to have even modest hope of stopping that two degree temperature increase. Yet when I've raised such questions, I'm ignored, disparaged, or even called a climate denier, which evokes comparison with Holocaust deniers. Israel. The Jewish people have long venerated intelligence, contribution, and learning. When choosing a spouse, those attributes, more than physicality, have long been central. That helps explain the Jewish people's outside accomplishments and contributions to the world. After 2,000 years of oppression capped by the Holocaust, the United Nations concluded that a tiny sliver of Middle Eastern desert, the Jews' biblical homeland, Judea, should be a haven for the Jews, Israel. Of course, it is surrounded by Arab countries with long-standing, perhaps jealousy-fueled hatred of Jews, which probably has been core to the continuing conflict. Alas, now, redistribution to the have-nots, in this case it's the Palestinians, is more than settlements or checkpoints, the true core of the double standard applied to Israel compared with Arab entities, for example, the Palestinians elected party Hamas, which is sworn by charter to Israel's destruction. Such redistribution is contributing to what Jews millennia long enemies want, the elimination of the Jewish people, which will be a loss to the world, science, entertainment, literature, help for the poor, everything. Affirmative action. In practice, affirmative action is often, maybe usually, reverse discrimination. We see it in the wildly different admission standards to medical school for blacks versus Asians or whites, and those are life and death decisions. Less momentous, but painful to my white and Asian clients. Many insist that they've been passed over for jobs and promotions in favor of less intelligent, less skilled, less hardworking, and higher maintenance African Americans. A number of such clients have cried or pounded the table in my office. I just read an article in the Wall Street Journal describing how an esteemed TV writer was told that his script would be produced, but only if he would change the main positive character to be black. A liberal, he agreed, but then was told that they decided they don't want a script from a white male. The evidence for reverse discrimination is ubiquitous. For example, just today, when I took a break from writing this very essay, I checked my email. It included an email from a client with a link to a five-day-old article in the New York Post that reported that a black man had many times failed the liberal arts and sciences exam to become a teacher. 90% of whites passed, while only 50% of blacks did. The blacks' lawyers successfully argued that the disparate impact, quote, means that the test is racist, and the man was awarded $2 million $55,383, including $1,583,114 in back pay for time never clocked, lost interest accrued, and other compensation. <clears throat> 225 people who failed that liberal arts and sciences test used for teacher licensing from 1994 to 2014 had already been notified that they're getting settlements of at least $1 million. I consume a lot of major media. How could I not have seen something about this in five days? Alas, rarely does reverse discrimination, even if egregious, get much media coverage. Then, after drafting this essay later today, I took a break so I could read it again with fresh eyes. I turned to the new client questionnaire for my next client. It's relevant that this client is a Japanese-American woman. She wrote, <clears throat> quote, a younger SVP, that's senior vice president, is one of the laziest people I've ever met. 
does not have the analytical skills or investment aptitude that I or more other more junior colleagues have and clearly got promoted because she is a black female, end quote. I have heard such stories from many clients, colleagues, and friends. Whenever merit is pushed to the back of the bus, we all suffer. The unfairly denied white and Asian candidates, the co-workers, bosses, and customers saddled with poorer products and services, and the increased silenced enmity that fills a balloon of anger, which may well explode. Imagine that you owned a solar farm and a hundred solar panels. To see which parts of your farm should get the most panels, you try out one panel in 10 spots. After that test, redistributist that you are, you decide to put the other 90 panels in the spots that in the trial produce the least solar energy. Obviously, you would produce much less energy than if you put your panels in the most productive spots. Yet society's reverse discrimination and demand for yet more is putting our solar panels, not even equally, but disproportionately in lower producing spots. Reparations. Much white and Asian accomplishment has been the result not of racial oppression, but of earned privilege, hard work, intelligence, and delaying gratification. And in calculating who should get reparations from we the taxpayer, if we're fair, we should consider the net impacts of a people. Yes, their victimization. Yes, their contributions to society relative to other groups. And their costs to society. Disproportionate crime, use of education and social service and health care resources, other compensatory social spending, plus countless small things. Over the past half century, $22 trillion has been spent on anti-poverty programs. I have a link to that. Yet the achievement gap remains as wide as ever. I have a link to that. In calculating who deserves reparations, we should consider not just the big and obvious, but the small and more ubiquitous. For example, when I want a break, I often frequent my nearby cafe for a little peace and quiet. But I'm too often startled from reverie by a car with a loud, clearly illegal exhaust and or pounding hip-hop music with windows open. Of course, those are small things, but such behaviors add up. And in calculating who should get reparations and how much, we are wise and fair to consider the total effects of all of it on all of us. To my knowledge, across the world's 195 countries, some majority black, some not, some that have been colonized, some not, blacks have for centuries been at or near the bottom in achievement and at or near the top in crime. Are all 195 countries for centuries guilty of systemic racism? Media, school, and college bias. Our opinions primarily derive from the schools, colleges, and media. And those speak largely with one voice, a redistributive one. Despite the dramatically higher black violent crime rate, and I have a link to FBI statistics on that, Blacks are disproportionately portrayed in the media as victims or heroes, white males as evil or clueless. A double standard certainly applies to politics. Hillary Clinton and President Biden and son Hunter are basically given a pass on what arguably affected the presidential election and national security more than did the Watergate break-in, which received years of massive coverage. I have become convinced that today's anti-merit Redistributive zeitgeist is wrong, a formula for societal regression and even dissolution, and that the views outlined here offer a more likely path to increased gross world happiness. Of course, not all these views may turn out to be correct. After all, the consensus is more likely to be correct than is an outlier, but such views would at least seem worthy of respectful consideration. Yet such views tend to be censored, censured, or canceled, the three C's, by today's orthodoxy, macro in the media, micro in private conversations. It's reminiscent of how Stalin, Hitler, and their followers crushed dissent. When I raise such issues, my colleagues and friends bristle, if not shun. So, because I'm aware that I am a mere thimble facing a tidal wave, lest I be drowned in the undertow, I've started to stay quiet, which makes me sad. My dominant feeling is resignation. 
in any event, I do thank you for watching. Um, that, uh, that essay is called I Am Resigned. Uh, as usual, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your thoughtful comments and uh, certainly appreciate it if you hit the share button below, share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.